today, everyone who is a first-time guest. If you're here uh, and I've never had a chance to meet you, I hope I get a chance to do that. My name is Al, and I'm the lead pastor here at Compassion. Uh, I want to welcome uh, especially our members and our regular attenders as well, but our, our first-time guests are always special. Uh, we hope that today you're going to uh, just be encouraged and lifted up by being here. You know, sometimes we when we come to church, and especially if it's a new place, like we don't know what to expect. We don't know if we're going to be you know, singled out or if we're going to not like it. And I hope that today has been a good experience for you so far. Uh, would you do us a favor, though? There is uh, inside of your worship folder, there's a connect card. And that is, uh, even though it's made of paper, it might as well be made of gold uh, for us because we love to connect with new first-time people. And so if you will fill that out today, hold on to it until the end of our services and go into the lobby. Uh, we have a Starbucks card that we will give to you in exchange for that. That's just our way of saying thank you. And yes, it is a shameless bribe for you to fill that out. So uh, please do that. Uh, I also want to say hello to our Facebook Live family that is watching today. Uh, we know that sometimes people utilize this uh, medium because you're on vacation or you're just playing hooky and you don't want to feel guilty, so you're watching. And you know what? That's okay. At least the word is getting out. So we're glad that you're here today. Uh, I want to talk about a few things that are going on in our church to, to just to let you know. Uh, we don't downshift during the summer in the sense of our programming. I mean, some things maybe kind of take a hiatus, but really we try to believe, work on this principle that what we plant in the summer is what we're going to read in the fall when it comes to spiritual things. So for us, we love to keep you connected. We love to, to keep you involved in groups. We love to keep you involved in meeting. We, of course, know that vacations will sometimes interrupt that. So we want to let you know about some things that are happening in your church so that you will just be aware of it. Uh, next week, of course, we're having our newcomer reception. And this is for anyone and everyone who is new uh, or uh, you've, you're kind of new to Compassion and you're wanting to know what we're all about, like what we, you know, just you want to meet some of the leaders. It'll be about a 30 minute or less uh, informal gathering over in the Compassion Center. It's a chance to ask questions about who we are, to get to know kind of our direction and things like that, and also to meet other people who are new just like you are. So if you've not signed up for that yet, would you please do that? And uh, you can do that by going out into the lobby and you can find that at the connecting point table and you can sign up for our guest reception. And then uh, in a couple of weeks, we're going to have a very special guest uh, here speaking for us, and that is going to be uh, Delaware County Sheriff Russ Martin. Uh, Russ Martin, you may not know, is, a, is an awesome leader, but he's also a, a believer in Christ. And so he's going to come and he's going to share just kind of some of his story that maybe you've never heard. And then we're going to hear how we can get involved and get behind some uh, organizations in our county, in our city, that are making a huge difference. And so uh, I want you to, to think about that and I'd love for you to come and be a part of that uh, and then uh, we're going to talk a little bit more about some other things that are happening uh, special events as well at the end of our time today so I hope that everyone is enjoying their summer uh, do you like summer how many are like me and just summer is the favorite time of the year Let's just admit it. Okay, we're, we're good with that. I know some of you sick people like winter. Um, fall is not so bad. Spring is okay, but it's rainy. But anyway, that's just my opinion, and you don't have to agree with it, but you have the right to be wrong. That's all right. So, um, so today, you know, I, I want to talk about summer. You know, what is, what is summer all about? What do we think about when we think about summer? We think about vacations. We think about barbecues, hanging around the pool, hanging around the beach, uh, later days, you know, we can stay out later, uh, yard work, eating copious amounts of ice cream, amen. Uh, so something else fun the hot season might well have going for it, though, is summer love. Summer love. You've heard that before. Michelle and I actually met uh, during the summer, and I fell in love with her. I don't know if she fell in love with me, but, um, you know, I stalked her until she gave in. But, you know, summer love is, is something that's in the air right now. And But oftentimes, I think... When, when we envision summer love, we think of love that's temporary or fleeting or, you know, when, when it gets warmer, uh, when it gets colder, rather, then everything is going to end. And it's a fleeting experience for most people. And, you know, I don't know why that is, but it, it could be that when we're in the summer, you know, we have more time to get out and be sociable. Uh, we have a, a time to spend more time around people that we may like. Uh, if you're a student, do we have any students in the 
building today? Any students? You're right. So you students know, like when you're on break, when you're not in school, you have more free time at your disposal. So that may be a time where you get involved in some type of summer romance or summer love. Uh, but but I think really it's it's about when we escape from our routines that we we start falling in that way that we can be more open to those types of things. But you know, if, if you follow the music and the movie industry. This phenomenon of summer love seems well evidenced. I mean, there are all kinds of songs, too many to name, about summer and summer love. And, but according to the reliable source, Wikipedia, there are at least seven songs with the title Summer Love in them, uh, from Justin Timberlake to One Direction, and ones that go all the way back to 1957, uh, right? So if you remember those, you're old. Um, three films from 1958, uh, 2001 and 2006, share the title Summer Love. Now, that that even that does not even count for Michelle's my wife's favorite movie Greece. Well, maybe it's not her favorite anymore now that she realizes what those lyrics are all about. But you remember, you know, the the song Summer Nights, Summer Fling, don't mean a thing and I'm not going to sing it for you. Summer Heat, Boy and Girl Meet, and then you know the the sad uh, ending of the song It Turned Colder, that's where it ends. And that's what happens. You know, we often think when the summer is over, then we just, we forget things. And, and what I found is that, that when it comes to summer love and romance, we're open to that when it comes to relationships with people. Or, uh, but how do we feel about a relationship with God? Maybe it's during the summer. It, it's no mistake that we send our kids off to summer camp and we send them to conferences like CIY so that they have uninterrupted time to, to be around other people who know God. They have a time to, to get to know who God is, and that's when decisions are made for God when we're, when we're in the summer. But oftentimes, we don't, have the, we don't have enough deep roots or a grounding, and when, the, when it gets colder, that's where it ends. That's where it ends for a lot of people. So I, I want to talk about that today. I want to talk about what it means to actually stay and find God in the summer so that it, it, it will sustain you all throughout your life. And so this is a great time to do that because many of us are more open. We're, we're seemingly in a better mood. Uh, we, we like what is happening during the summer. So I want to talk about that and seize on that activity because I want to talk about what it means today to love God. When we're talking about summer love, let's talk about what it means to love the one who loved us first. And I, I know that when I say that, some people are like, I, I don't know how to love God. I know that I, that I hear about it. I know that I believe in God. I know that I come to church some, you know, very often, but I don't know how I am actually supposed to love God. How do I love someone that I've never seen? How do I love someone <clears throat> that, that occasionally will disappoint me or let me down or not, not answer my prayer? And those are all great questions. Those are all good things to, to think about. And so that's why I want to have this discussion. But, but I, I want us to just you know, think about it like this. Pastor Tim Keller actually gave an example of sometimes how we, we treat God when it comes to being in a relationship with God. And this does not apply to everybody, but I think at different times in our lives, it may, it may apply to some of us. And so what he says is that, you know, sometimes we, we actually love God just for the stuff or what he's supposed to give to us. And it's always based on our terms. Like, like we're, we're going to love God as long as you're meeting what I want and what I expect for you rather than loving God for God's own sake. And so here's what he writes. He says, imagine being in a situation where you were dating somebody and you were falling in love. And as a part of getting to know one another, you let it be known to the person that you're getting married to that when you get married, you're going to come years later into a significant trust fund. And when you tell your, your significant other that, they're like, it doesn't matter to me. I, I love you for who you are. I love you whether you're rich or poor or somewhere in between. So imagine that happening. And so, you know, it, it doesn't matter to them. But then suppose that just before the wedding is going to happen, you learned that all of a sudden you're not going to receive that trust fund. And you relay that to your spouse-to-be and he or she has a crestfallen look on their face. They get disappointed. So much so, they call off the wedding. How would you feel about that? What would you, what would you think about that other person's love for you? What would you say? Well, you, you would start to have self-doubt. Like, well, wait a minute. You never loved me for me, did you? You were just using me. You loved me because I was going to get you somewhere or get you something. You didn't love me for me. 
And friends, I wonder if sometimes we take that very same approach to God in our relationship with Him. Like our love for God is based on temporary fleeting things like summer love. Like we, we think that if God doesn't fit everything that I want, He doesn't give me everything that I want, then, then I'm, not going to, I'm not going to be able to be in that relationship with Him. So what if I told you it didn't have to be that way? What if I told you that your love for God does not have to be fickle like a summer romance? What if I told you that, that your love for God could actually grow deeper because, because of something that is revealed in Scripture of how you can do that? What if I, what if I gave you that, uh, this idea that you can have assurance of God's love? Like you can be assured that no matter what other people have said about you or no matter what you think of yourself, that God loves you deeper and more than any person ever will. Because I believe your spiritual life is going to take off when you have an assurance of where you stand with God. Like when you know that God, is, God loves you, then that is when your spiritual life is going to take off. But so many of us don't want to take that risk because we're not really sure that God loves us. We're like, you know, I, I'm just kind of debating this right now because of what I've done. Have you ever risked your life, risk it all for God if you're not sure that God is yours? You see, Martin Luther, who was a church reformer back in the day, he believed that oftentimes people would only obey if they were threatened with harsh consequences if they rebelled. He said, like, the only way you're ever going to really convert people is you got to dangle the carrot of heaven out in front of them and say, but the only way you get this is if you stop acting so disobediently toward God and, and, and preach all the time, relentlessly on hell. I mean, how would you feel if every single Sunday when you left this place, when you left Compassion Christian, you left like kind of with your tail between your legs, like thinking, man, what good am I? What, what kind of person am I? Uh, does God really love me? A am I saved? Have I lost my salvation? Have I, have I really done enough to, to merit God's favor? That is not how you and I are supposed to live. In fact, Martin Luther called this the damnable doctrine of doubt. He said, yeah, it's okay to be afraid of judgment because that will produce a surface level obedience, but underneath that thin veneer of obedience will eventually rush a river of fear, pride, and self-interest. And the only way to develop real love for God is to actually have your fears of God removed. Now, the Bible does have a verse that says the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. But what that means is, is you have a respect for God, a healthy respect, that, that you're not afraid, oh, today is the day that God is going to zap me from heaven. Today is the day that God is going to strike me with cancer. That's not the fear of God because that's, that's not who God is. So how do you have your fears removed? So that's what we're talking about in this, in this series called Summer Love. And, and what I want to leave you here uh, knowing this, what I want to leave you with, I hope that you'll leave here today knowing this, that love for God actually grows in the assurance of God's love. So you, you're thinking, I, I can't love God. I, I don't know how to do that. Well, it may be because you don't have an assurance of the fact that God loves you. That you may not think that God accepts you for where you are right now. You see, love for God only grows in assurance of the love of God. And here's what I want you to hear. God wants you to know that He loves you. God wants you to be assured that He loves you. In fact, all throughout the, the, the letter that I've chosen for today, we're going to, we're going to see this. Uh, I want you to turn in your Bibles to 1 John. So in 1 John, I want you to turn to chapter 2. And then uh, you're also going to be going over to chapter 5, kind of back and forth. But in this letter, it's written by a follower of God. called uh, His name is John. And throughout the, this letter, he refers to the believers who are reading this as little children. Now, I know that, you know, if you're older, you don't really want to be called a child. You don't want someone who's younger than you to refer to you as a child. But when he's writing this, he's giving this, this, this picture of that we serve God as our father and we are his children. And God wants anything, God, God wants beyond anything for you to know that you are loved by him. J.D. Greer, who's a pastor in Raleigh, uh, actually gave, gave this example, and I want to use it because he says it better than, than I was able. Here's what he says. He says, a good father wants his kids to know that he loves them and is committed to them. He said, when I go away on a trip, for example, I don't say to my kids, hey, guys, I'm going on a trip, so I'll see you when I get back, or, or maybe I won't. Maybe I won't come back. Maybe I'm not your dad at all. Like, maybe I've got another family who, who lives out of town, and that's who I'm going to see. And so I just want you to think about that while I'm gone so that you'll be more obedient when I get back. 
Now, what kind of sicko father would do that? There's, there's nobody who would do that, right, in their own right mind. And so that would not produce love and loyalty in your children. It would not do that. In fact, it might produce for a while temporary fear-based obedience, but it's only a matter of time until fear-based obedience turns into father-hating rebellion. You see, you can't, you can't make people choose something if they don't want to choose it in their heart. That is not going to produce it that way. And so you have a father, I want you to know, who cares about you, who wants you to have assurance, who wants you to know that you can be saved. And so God doesn't want you and I to feel like orphans because God, who is the best father, wants you to know that you can be adopted into his family, that you can be saved, that you can have assurance of, of, of what that is. And so First John, this letter that we're going to look at just for a moment today, gives a series of ways of knowing that you're saved. You might even call them a test of whether or not you're saved. And it's going to show you that if your experience with God is genuine, uh, then, then you're saved. If you know who God is, then you're saved. And today, we come to something that's foundational and, and so fundamental that if this is not true of you, it could be that you have never seriously Come to the love of the Father the way you should. And maybe today you've grown up in church. You've, you've grown up and you were there every time the doors opened. And with your head, you acknowledged who God was. And maybe you made a decision to get your parents off your back or you did it because of peer pressure. But you never truly owned that decision for yourself. And so if you are believing that, then, then maybe today I've got good news for you. And so what I want you to understand is if you've never had an experience with the one true God on your own, and you've never experienced his love, then you have to question whether or not, whether or not you have truly repented and, and come to God. And so that's why I'm not here to scare you, but I'm here to tell you how you can be assured through this. And so I want you to look at the first part of 1 John chapter 2, and we're going to look at verses 15 through 17. 15 through 17, again, the verses will be up on the screen. I hope that uh, if you don't have a copy of the scriptures with you, that this will be uh, an aid to you. He says, do not love the world or anything in the world. If anyone loves the world, love for the Father is not in them. For everything in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life comes not from the Father, but from the world. The world and its desires pass away, but whoever does the will of God lives forever. Now, I wonder if, if you have ever thought about what does he mean by not loving the world? What does he mean by not loving, does he mean the world that we live in? Does he mean like I need to become an ascetic, which means I need to become either, if you're female, I need to become a, a nun, or if you're a male, I need to become a monk, and I need to just kind of reject everything in the world. I never go to see movies. I don't go on vacation. I don't, you know, I don't like things. I never smile. Is that what he means? That's not what he means. He doesn't also mean that you hate culture, that you, that you say, I'm just going to stay in my little bubble and I'm never going to engage the culture. I'm never going to try to make a difference for Christ. That's not what he means either. What he's, what he's talking about is, is so very critical. Here's what he means by not loving the world. When he says don't love the world, he, he is telling you and I the first move that you need to make, the first move that you need to make toward God to receive his love. And here's what it is. It means that you don't lust after the world that is in rebellion against God. Now, you can look for examples and see this all around. Whatever is in rebellion against God is what we would call worldly. So that's what he means. Don't love the worldly things that are in rebellion against God. And, and you're wondering, how do I even know what that is? Well, in verse 16, he tells you. He tells us what to look for, and he lists them in three ways. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. And these are all things he says, they, they don't come from God, they come from the world. And the word he uses for, the word for lust is the word that, that basically means a desire that has taken on too much weight. Too much weight, a craving that has taken on such weight in your life that it controls you. That's what it means, that that's what, what lust is. And so what is the lust of the flesh? What, is the, what does it mean to, to, to suffer and, and strain against the lust of the flesh? That's when basically some good thing that God creates becomes so important in your life that you either feel like you cannot be happy without it or it takes on such an important role in your life that you're willing to disobey God to get it. Like you know that it's wrong 
and you know God says something against it, but it doesn't matter because your desire for it is stronger than your desire to obey God. Let's take the example of sex for a moment. Sex is a good creation of God. It's a good creation of God, and it ought to be greatly enjoyed, but yet it has to be enjoyed in the way that God intended and prescribed. It has to be enjoyed within the confines of a committed, monogamous, heterosexual marriage. I know that's not a popular message today, but that's what the Word of God says. It is that, that is the truth of God's Word. And so, but, but when you say, when, when we say, well, I want to I wanna, uh, operate in this realm of sex regardless of whether or not I do it according to God's will, that is worldly. That's when we're treating it like an ultimate thing. It becomes worldly to us. And so we have a cultural obsession with sex, don't we? It's always been that way. Sex sells, right? Sex is used to sell everything. A few years ago, I was watching the Super Bowl, and I could not for the life of me figure out what sex had to do with the GoDaddy website company. But that's what they used to sell and, and get people talking about their commercials. And, of course, it increased all of the visits to their site. It increased their, their revenue because that's what it's used. You go to the grocery store, and you know if you have a young kid who starts to read and they start to understand things, I remember going through the grocery store with my kids, and they would be reading the, the magazines and the titles, and they're like, I'm like, don't, don't look, just straight ahead, keep looking, because the world entices us to say, here's how you need to use it. You need to do it for you. And you know, let me just kind of get stepping on toes for a minute. The way our culture teaches girls to dress and teaches young men to respond to it is, is a sexualized culture. We, we teach young women that the, your only value is to dress provocatively so that people notice you. And then we teach our young men the way you, the way you objectify women is that you use them for, for whatever pleasure that you can get. And that is, why, that is why there's so much wrong in our schools and so much wrong in our world. And so, yeah, you might want to dress that way because it's fashionable, but sometimes you have to be unfashionable to be obedient to Jesus. And you may have to be unpopular to be obedient to Jesus. And, and young men, fathers, mothers, we need to teach our young boys that young girls are not objects for your pleasure. They are to be treasured and cherished and loved for who they are because they are made in the image of God just like you are. So that is the lust of the, the flesh that we see. There's also what he calls the lust of the eyes. Now, the lust of the eyes is when you see something good in the world that is so important to you that, that you won't be happy until you have it. And for a lot of people in the room, or maybe a lot of people that you know, it's money. Like you're jealous of other people who have more money than you, or you resent those who have made it higher in the world than you have, and, you're, and you resent people who have it and you don't. So what do we do? We make unwise decisions to obtain these things. And maybe we put ourselves and our families in bad financial situations, so we go into debt because we want to live that lifestyle. Or we don't give, we don't tithe generously. And if you're in a place where you can't afford to be generous toward other people and toward God, you might ask yourself, have I succumbed to the lust of the eyes? Or if you can't give up something that God might be calling you to give up, Maybe you're suffering from that. Or you save so much money for a rainy day that you can have a month of rainy days and you still not in, uh, dent into your savings. Then that's causing you to, to put your security in what you can see, the lust of the eyes. And then he says there's the pride of life. Now, the pride of life is when we... Now, there's nothing wrong with your accomplishments. I mean, if you're working, you can give honor and glory to God for your accomplishments. You can reflect that glory back to Him. But you see, the pride of life is when we do things when, and we glory, we find pleasure, we get our self-worth out of our accomplishments in life. Like we say, well, I'm, I'm more successful than my siblings are. I'm more successful than my parents ever were. I'm more successful than anybody in my family or anybody on my block. That is when we, we're getting in the pride of life. You see, forgetting, of course, that everything we've ever done or everything we've ever had is the result of a gift that is given to us. Now, the other way that you can boast uh, is to assume things make your life so stable that you have nothing to worry about. Have you ever thought that? You know, you're saying, well, I don't worship money. I just really love to be secure in what I have. Now, there's nothing wrong with that, but if that security becomes your God, if that security becomes your idol then that's the problem, right? So think right now, what makes you confident about your future? When you think about your future and if you're confident, what is it that gives you that confidence? Is it your ability? Is it your money? Is it your inheritance? Is it your trust fund? Is it 
your ability to bounce back, to make money, whatever it is. John says, don't be consumed by these things. Because if your life is consumed with these things, then it shows the love of the Father has been displaced in your life. That the love of the Father should be first, but now it's no longer in first place. John says, don't be consumed by these things. And so what he's talking about is idolatry. That's what idolatry is. I want to prove it to you. So I want you to look back in your scriptures. Uh, turn to the last verse in the book of 1 John. In 1 John chapter 5, verse 21, it's a very odd verse, and it seems like it doesn't belong. It seems like John just kind of threw that in when he's writing, and he just wanted one more thing to say, and that's what he said. He says, Dear children, keep yourselves from idols. Now, he uses that term again. Children, keep yourselves from idols. Now, sometimes people get confused by this verse, like, you know, wh why, why did he even put it here? Because he's not even talking about idols or idolatry in the entire epistle so far. It's like he's introducing this new concept but the other way you look at it, which is the way I see it, is that he's actually summarizing everything he's been teaching. Do not worship idols. Do not let something that is good become ultimate. You see, when you, when you cease putting ultimate weight on the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life, and then God's glory takes place in your life and gives weight in your heart, that is when you have eradicated false worship. Repentance is simply this. You know, if you heard the word repentance, repentance just means that you turn away from your sin and you turn back to God. But I think here's another way to think about repentance. Repentance is actually beginning to worship God as God again. Because you have displaced God in your life and now you repent and you say, God, I'm worshiping you as God again. I've been worshiping other things as idols. And so my question to the audience, has that happened to you? I know that many of you may, uh, you know, you have a, a salvation experience. You may, you know, I prayed a prayer to receive Jesus or, you know, I asked Jesus into my heart or I came forward at a, at a camp or a church or a revival. But my question is, did you really, really and truly repent of the idolatry and come back to the love of God? So what is idolatry? Is it, a, is it a, a, a form? Is it a figurine that you make and you carve or you mold out of something, some type of material? That's not what idolatry is. Idolatry is when you love something more than God. Idolatry is when you depend on something more than God and when you obey something more than God. That's what idolatry is. It's when a good thing is an ultimate thing and it controls your emotions and it causes us to dream about having those things. What are you terrified about losing? Like if you thought about one thing, there's one thing in my life I could not live without. I could not live without this or that person. What is that one thing? Is it your money? Is it your marriage? Is it your kids or a hobby? Are these things ultimate in your life? Are you an idolater? Well, I stand before you today telling you that, that I have struggled with idolatry in my life, as we all have. I've struggled with what's important to me. Is it a quest for prestige and a, a larger church and, and, and having my kids to make straight A's and so that I can glory in that? Who do you trust in the most and what do you trust in the most? What would be the one thing that you would need to, to be in your life to feel secure about the future? What are you most faithful to obey? What is it about uh, in your life? Now, I know that there are those who are enslaved to other people's opinions, that they live every second of every day worrying about how to please other people, and they live willing to do anything to get that affirmation. That's what they do. It's not just high school students that you could describe like that. It's adults. That we live every minute of every day wanting someone's affirmation. So I want to summarize for you three things that John is trying to teach us from this passage about how to actually love God. Here's the first one. When you love the world too much, too little of God in your life. So what I mean is when you crave the things of the world that shows the love of God has not filled your life. Your heart has a tremendous capacity for God, and if God is not there, you crave other things. Your heart has been described as a vacuum, and something will replace it if you take God out. It's not if you worship, but what you worship. And all the things of the world you put there will not satisfy you. The lust of the flesh and eyes and the pride of life are something like salt water. 
If you've ever swallowed or ingested accidentally salt water, you realize that that is not going to satisfy you. It's going to make you sick eventually. It's never going to, it's going to make you thirstier. It's never going to quench what you're desiring. It looks like something that would take away your thirst, but the more you drink, the thirstier you become. And maybe today you're caught up in that. I recently read a, a comment pop star Madonna made in Vogue magazine years ago. And if you don't know who Madonna is, she was like the Beyonce of my generation. Um, Kind of, I guess. Um, but here's what she said. And if you're wondering why I read Vogue magazine, no comment. Um, but <laughs> I, I found it. I'm just kidding. Uh, so it says, here's what she said. She said, my drive in life comes from a fear of being mediocre. That is always pushing me. I push past one spell of it and discover myself as a special human being. But then... I feel I am still mediocre and uninteresting unless I do something else. Because even though I have become somebody, I still have to prove that I am somebody. My struggle has never ended, and I guess it never will. And maybe you're caught on that treadmill right now. Like you're, and you know, I think Madonna knows herself pretty well. And she might know herself better than we know ourselves. We will find some form of ultimate satisfaction in one way or another. And if we don't choose the love of God, we will choose the lust of the flesh and the eyes and the pride of life. Guaranteed. That's what we'll choose. Could it be that all your stress, all your straining, all your dissatisfaction, all your worry and your envy and jealousy is pointing you toward the fact that you have never repented of your idolatry? You've never said, you know what, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to try to live with one foot in the world and being worldly and one foot in the kingdom of God. And that's where a lot of us get stuck. We think, well, I can still do the same things. I can still swear the way I used to. I can still abuse drugs and alcohol the same way I did. And, and you know what, it doesn't matter. Actually, it does matter because those things become ultimate in your life. The second thing that John would teach you is that the way to overcome the world is by embracing the love of the Father. So idolatrous love of the world shows that the love of God is missing from your life. The way to free yourself from it is to actually love the, by, by embracing the love of God. By saying, you know what, I know now that God loves me and so I'm going to embrace it. How do you embrace the love of God? What do you do? Is there a secret formula? You know, some people think, well, the way I do that is I beat myself up for not loving God more. And I hope that's not the only thing you get out of the sermon days. You go home and say, well, I obviously don't love God as much as Pastor Al says I should. That's not what I'm talking about. Don't beat yourself up for, for not being there. Embrace the love of God for you. Actually believe and embrace the fact that God loves you. No matter what anybody has said or done to you, God loves you. And he wants to know you. God gives salvation a perfect love as a gift. And on the cross, Jesus did everything necessary to save you, and he said, it's finished. You know, one of the things that Jesus said on the cross, one of the seven things was, it is finished. That just simply meant, now it's over. You don't have to try to be good enough. You don't have to, have to earn your salvation. You don't have to try to be better than a serial killer or a, a child rapist. You don't have to be better than them. You just have to accept my gift of grace by faith. That's all. It is finished. It is done. So to be saved is just to embrace that and to rest in it. And so I, I want to tell you a few verses, just give you a few verses very quickly here uh, from 1 John. The first one is 1 John 5, verse 4. Listen to what he says. For everyone born of God overcomes the world. This is the victory that has overcome the world, even our faith. What that verse means is that your salvation is not a reward for having overcome the world. Salvation is the power by which you overcome the world. Are you saved? Then you have the power to overcome the world in worldly things. And, and why, why do I need to love God? What motivation do I have? 1 John 4, 19 answers that. We love because He first loved us. We love because we know that He, he loves us. Knowledge of the love of God for you will produce eventually the love of God in you. Knowledge of the love of God for you will produce the love of God, love for God in you. Another one, 1 John 5, 20. He says, we also know that the Son of God has come and has given us understanding so that we may know Him who is true. And we are in Him who is true by being in His Son, Jesus Christ. He is a true God and eternal life. So here's what I love about what God does. God says, because you love me and because you know who I am, now you can avoid the false gods the idols, 
that are vying for your attention. Acceptance, pleasure, prestige, money, whatever it is. You can avoid all that and say, you know what, I I have the love of God in me. So faith in this, friends, that God's perfect love given to you in Jesus that overcomes the world. And so when you have him, you found him, you found the true God, the, the, you have real eternal life, the perfect love of God is in you, you won't give yourself to the love of, uh, or the lust of the flesh. You won't lust after the world anymore, which brings me to the third thing I think John is teaching us. Once you stop lusting for the world, you'll truly love the world. You'll truly love that, that the world God's created, and you won't say, you know what, i, I got to have these things. I'm praying that God is going to use this series of sermons to enable us to know what is, it is really like to love God and in turn be able to, to love our neighbors and love our family and love our world. You know, when I was studying this week, it occurred to me that the only way you can give away the things of the world and, uh, and reach the world for the gospel is that you don't depend on those things for happiness that the things you have are only temporary. My prayer is that you would not lust after the world in order that you could actually love the world and you'd be willing to give up anything to hear, for people to hear the gospel. The only way you can, get, can let it go is this, by finding something better than the world can give. Have you found something better than the world can give? And that, my friends, is the love of the Father. And here's one other thing. By realizing that everything you give up in the world to follow Jesus, you'll gain in eternity. That's why in, in 1 John 2, 17, he says, And the world is passing away with its desires, but whoever does the will of God abides forever. So what is your idol today? What are you giving your life to obtain? Because one day you'll lose it. Death will take it away. Your empire will crumble. Your fortune will be pilfered away and spent by someone else. Your memory will fade from the earth. But for those who make God their God and build their lives on His kingdom, they will experience down here blessings and continue to experience them forever. You know, life is pretty beautiful when you know Jesus. It's not perfect, but life has a way of of working itself out when you know who God is. And yet, what we experience here is like the junior varsity version. In heaven, it's the varsity version of, of everything that we experience down here. So that's why I'm not worried about driving the nicest car down here because eventually it's, it's all going to be gone anyway. I'm worried about my reward in heaven. Uh, many of you probably heard of David Livingston. Remember the, the phrase, Dr. Livingston, I presume? Kind of, you know, that, that same thing. David Livingston was an African missionary, and when he was alive, people kind of like venerated him, celebrated him for the fact that he was just, you know, the man when it came to, to the Lord and following Jesus. And they gave him a lot of props, and they were really celebrating him for his sacrifice. And listen to what he wrote in his memoirs about this. Actually, he said this at Cambridge University. He said, People talk of the sacrifice I have made in spending so much of my life in Africa. Can that be called a sacrifice which is simply paid back as a small part of a great debt owing to our God, which we can never repay? Is that a sacrifice which brings its own blessed reward in healthful activity, the consciousness of doing good, peace of mind, and a bright hope of a glorious destiny hereafter? Away with the word in such a view and with such a thought. It is emphatically no sacrifice. Say rather it is a privilege, anxiety, sickness, suffering, or danger now and then with a foregoing of the common conveniences and charities of this life may make us pause and cause the spirit to waver and the soul to sink. But let this only be for a moment. All these are nothing when compared with the glory which shall be revealed in and for us. I never made a sacrifice. What dominates your life? Is it the love of the Father or is it love of the world? Maybe you grew up in a church and you grew up knowing about God, but you realize today you've never truly known who God is. There's no personal experience of God and the love of God in your life. And therefore you realize, I don't have a personal relationship with God, but that can change today. That can change when you realize that, that God loves you deeper and, and he's loved you longer than anyone will ever love you. And he stands ready today to offer that gift of salvation to anyone who would receive it by faith, who would call on his name, who would forsake the world 
and the lust of, the, of these things we've talked about and say, God, I want you and I want you as my treasure. And today you can do that as we stand together in just a moment and sing our commitment song. But before we get there, I want us to pray and I want us to talk to our Father about our decision here. Let's, let's bow together. Father, for many of us, we've simply had just like the superficial knowledge of who you are, and we've tolerated like church, we've tolerated spiritual teachings, we've tolerated these things because maybe we felt like it was a secret formula, uh, some type of incantation, some type of good luck charm that would keep us free from calamities in life. And now, Lord, we've come to realize that that's not true at all. God, there's something that, that has brought us here today. There's some reason that, that everybody who's here in this room is here. And it could be that for the very first time, someone is, is having a, a breakthrough, that you truly do love them, and that you're calling them back to yourself. And God, I pray that someone today would come and, and say yes to you and surrender to you. I pray, Lord, that someone just from where they're sitting would rededicate themselves and, and say, you know what, I'm tired of playing games. I'm tired of just messing around and, and not taking this seriously, and I'm going to do that. Lord, it's in community that we can stay connected with each other and encourage one another, but it's in isolation that we'll die. So I pray that today we would choose community. We choose to be here. So Lord, use this time to draw us close, and we pray in your son's name. Amen.